my name is Lyudmila Lebyeva. I'm a Russian fashion theory editor-in-chief and also um, academic director of the Doctoral School in Arts and Design High School of Economics. And uh, I'm happy to um, present today this and to actually moderate uh, this uh, panel on sustainable fashion uh, 2020, the Swedish experience. And uh, before I introduce all uh, the panelists, all the fantastic panelists today, I I'd like to say that this uh, conference uh, is organized with the support of the Embassy of Sweden, uh, the Swedish Institute and the High School of Economics, Arts and Design School, uh, Moscow. And uh, now I'm uh, happy to uh, introduce uh, all the participants and uh, I'm, I'm going to, to go not in alphabetical order, but just in the way I can see the, not the black squares, but the squares on a Zoom uh, conference. So we have uh, Sandra Ross with us, head of the sustainability department of the Swedish fashion brand Kapal, consultant for the exhibition Fashion Revolution, the Future of Textiles, the exhibition which we will get back uh, shortly uh, to. Sandra, hello. Uh, we also uh, have with us uh, Mathilde Tam, uh, Dr. Mathilde Tam, Professor of Design at Linus University, Sweden. Hello, Mathilde. Hello. Uh, Dr. Philip Warkander, uh, Associate Professor, Head of Fashion Research at Lund University. Philip, hello. Hello. Uh, Evalena Jonsson, designer, co-founder and designer of the sustainable uh, fashion brand uh, Residus. Hello, Evalena. Hi. Uh, uh, Jonas Larsson, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Textiles, Engineering and Business at the Swedish School of Textiles at the University of Buros. Hello, thank you. Hello, hello everyone uh, for joining this panel and uh, just a few words before we start. Uh, this uh, panel uh, is organized um, as a response to the exhibition uh, Fashion uh, Revolution, uh, the Future of Textiles, which was uh, created uh, by the Swedish Institute. But unfortunately, as we know, due to the circumstances we are all aware of, uh, the physical exhibition can't take place. So we decided to actually have this panel to talk about the issues the exhibition addresses. And uh, just a few words about the topic. Uh, well, I be began to be interested in uh, sustainability uh, issues a long time ago. And let's say uh, this uh, kind of thinking um, was uh, it intensified exactly at the point when we at, fashion, at Russian Fashion Theory started to work on a special Nordic issue in which uh, Sweden uh, also participated and Philip, uh, who is with us today, uh, actually submitted his uh, paper in, in it. Uh, then we had a couple of other issues which were devoted to sustainability uh, and fashion. But even though, yes, uh, there have been a lot of publications, there have been so many events uh, organized uh, in connection with this topic, there are still so many questions left. And uh, I'm myself so excited about this topic and I have so many questions. I really happy to moderate this event and ask my questions. Uh, but uh, since our uh, panel is uh, streamed on YouTube, those who watch us on YouTube, uh, you have a chance to ask questions and comment uh, and uh, all the participants will be able to uh, answer your questions as well. So let's, let's get it started. And uh, my first question is addressed uh, to uh, Sandra, uh, who uh, actually uh, was the consultant for the exhibition, uh, Fashion Revolution, the Future of Textiles. And uh, Sandra, could you please say a few words about the projects which we can't see, but at we can talk about uh, and address all those uh, bigger things which uh, the exhibition works with? Mm -hmm. I have made a short uh, presentation actually that I would love to share. Absolutely. So um, let's see, can you see my screen now? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Put it in presentation uh, mode. It's a bit slow. I'm trying to. Uh, yes. Now you can still see my um, screen. Uh, yeah. We, yes, we can. All is good. Mm? 
Uh, so Fashion Revolution, the Future of Textiles, is an exhibition made by the Swedish Institute, as you said. And I, uh, who present to you, I'm uh, in my new role from August this year, Head of Sustainability at the Swedish fashion brand Kapol. But in my former role as a researcher, I contributed with fact-checking. And also in the inauguration of this beautiful live exhibition in Lithuania. Um, and the aim is to show how the Swedish fashion industry is in a development phase. Uh, it's in a transition to a more sustainable and circular business model, which is both natural and necessary. And it's an exciting time when research, innovation and cross-disciplinary collaborations are paving the way for a fashion industry that can set an example for the rest of the world. One uh, mention in the material is the, is the research program Mistra Future Fashion that many of us in the panel today have been part of. Um, it's a large investment into sustainable fashion and during eight years, we had experts in business models, design research, environmental assessment, consumer behavior, policy development, the material and technology and industry uh, that found each other. And that's one of the major assets of this program, Mr. Future Fashion, that the systemic change is not reached via policies or consumer insights or material development or multi-stakeholder initiatives, but of all that together. So the summarizing outlook report that you can find on mrfuturefashion.com and all the other material is based on consensus and collaboration between all these disciplines, which is unique. And my part in Mr. Future Fashion was life cycle assessment for the first time looking on clothing consumption on the systemic level instead of studying individual garments. And we can see in this chart that production dominates climate impact and especially wet treatment in the bottom is the largest contributor to climate impact but also toxicity and water use for example. Um, and if every garment could be used twice as long, we could nearly cut climate emissions by half. And regarding other environmental uh, impacts, we saw that conventional cotton dominates the contribu contribution to water scarcity. Uh, which means that we now know where we must put our efforts in changing because it's clear that we need measurability, for example, with the science-based targets initiative or the UN Cl climate playbook for fashion. And I think that we have come past the brainstorming phase now uh, with lots of suggestions of what we can do to a new phase where we all need to assure that our actions are effective. Because uh, year 2100, eight years from now, we are expected to be 11 billion people on this planet and we will all need textiles. And that means that we need a textile industry that can balance the social needs with the environmental burden. And this exhibition uh, shows many examples and I hope you can dig into the digital material and be inspired by these wonderful examples. And there are fibers that can substitute cotton, like for example forest-based fibers. And this dress is made in paper fibers from the Swedish forests. We have other examples of synthetic textiles made from bio-based materials. Um, there are also examples on new technology. As I showed you, the wet treatment, the dyeing and finishing is very intensive for environmental impact. But this bag is manufactured with spin-dyed 
fibers where color is added to the dry fibers. It's also called dope dye or solution dye. And uh, after eight years research, it's actually uh, the only technical invention we have seen with a huge potential for reduction of both climate, water and toxic impacts. And uh, what we have seen is that most other impactful actions are, uh, for example, to improve efficiency or switch to non-fossil energy. But as for a sort of technical invention that can make a big difference, uh, spin dye, dry dyeing technology is what we uh, can gain a lot from. Uh, and to take one example from Kapol, uh, that's part of the transparency and collaboration uh, topic in the material. And uh, I must say I'm very proud to now be colleague of Eva Kindgren, who in 2018 took the initiative to start a Swedish collaboration for climate action, the Swedish Textile Initiative for Climate Action, together with H&M, Peak Performance and Sustainable Fashion Academy. And today uh, we have over 40 brands uh, participating in this network. Uh, there are very many networks, but in this case, the Stika members commit themselves to follow the Paris Agreement and set science-based targets for keeping below 1.5 degree global temperature increase, which means absolute reductions with 50% until 2030. We include all three scopes according to the greenhouse gas protocol and we collaborate by evaluating existing tools for measuring and reporting. We collaborate in developing action plans, supporting common suppliers in the production countries and uh, evaluating solutions for emission reductions. Because it's no small task to reduce climate emissions by half in 10 years. Uh, and I cannot really see how any company should be able to succeed with that all alone. Um, and in the exhibition that I hope that you will take part of, uh, you will find examples of circular business models, solutions for longer lifespan, better fibers, water and chemicals management, uh, reduction of microplastics, energy and transport, textile recycling, and many more examples of transparency and collaboration. Thank, thank you, you and thank enjoy. You. Yeah. Sandra, thank you so much for uh, introducing and uh, speaking more about the exhibition itself and uh, about the COPAL uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, what you have spoken about uh, mostly concerns production, mm -hmm. but we understand that uh, fashion isn't uh, about production only. It's uh, above all <laughs> about consumption. And uh, well, it takes two uh, to solve the problem. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Mathilda uh, if, um, uh, yes, how we, how we can, uh, how we can uh, maybe, I don't know, teach or orient consumers, you know, in, in this, so that they change uh, their ways. Uh, because as I said earlier, yes, it's, it's not about, you know, producers only, it's about bigger moves and bigger steps on the part of the consumers. Uh, so maybe, yes, you, you share your ide ideas on, on this uh, matter. Thank you, Lidmila. Is, is this, sorry, I just need to clarify, is this when I show my slides or is, is this, uh... A different time. Well, actually, you can either, you know, just ask, answer a question. If you feel like your presentation uh, refers to this, uh, let's uh, do it the way is best. Okay, I'll, I'll just answer the question now, I think. I think it takes more than two to tango. So I think it takes certainly uh, users that I would prefer to say instead of consumers. It takes the people who make stuff, so industry. It takes governance. Uh, it also takes media. So we have a, a great um, 
project in, in engaging with media so that we don't get into the spin of black is the new green, green is the new purple, but we, we have a con continuous idea of, of uh, what's good for, for planet and people. And for me, a central concept to, to get all these uh, sectors working together and to having a sound relationship with fashion together is to think about care because care can radically transform our relationship with fashion, with uh, other people and with other species. And care also decentralizes and deprofessionalizes our engagement with sustainability. So whereas sustainability can feel really like an expert feel, everybody can understand care. I care for you, I, I do some self-care, I care for the planet, I look after my clothes, so I care for them. So I, I think that's a concept that we can uh, join, join up around all these different sectors. Thank you so much. You actually mentioned, yes, uh, this uh, important concept of care, which uh, it seems uh, is uh, growing these days uh, sp specifically uh, because we spend uh, more time indoors. We spend more time these days uh, together, you know, close to our existing wardrobes uh, and might probably, you know, uh, grow uh, more affectionate relationships with the clothes we already have. Do you think there is a potential for this? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think uh, care is about looking after the clothes we have, but also engaging in fashion more as a verb than a noun. So we're fashioning, we're fashioning through making images, we're fashioning through looking after our clothes, we're fashioning through engaging in styling or curation, in sharing clothes. So I think there, there are so many different ways of, of coming to fashion through care, but certainly maintenance and repair that's one very important part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And actually, uh, it leads us to, to another question, uh, which uh, is connected with education, because I think we uh, got out of use of taking care of our clothes. We often don't know how to mend uh something yes which is which is uh, broken i don't know how to mend you know if you if you have a problem i don't know we, we, if you have a hole what can you do with it well uh buy a new one a new a new item of clothing this is probably uh what most of the people do so because uh somehow we lost this uh basic skills and it leads us to this point of uh talking about education uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to address this uh, question to all those uh, participants who are involved in educating, and I know that quite a lot of uh, the participants are, uh, but before I, I, I do it, I'd like to uh, quote, uh, quote uh, Trent um, forecaster Lee Edelkert. Of course, you all know uh, that, uh, you know, uh, talk uh, from uh, 2015 in which he spoke about the end of fashion. Uh, I'm not going yes, to, to talk much about the end of fashion. We are not, uh, you know, uh, we haven't uh, got together today to mourn uh, about the end of fashion. No, not really. We are talking about some new beginnings. But I'd like to uh, specifically address the point uh, where she speaks about uh, education. She says that uh, young designers, uh, are, we still educate our young people to become catwalk designers, unique individuals, wh whereas uh, this society is now about exchange and new economy and working together in teams and groups. But it's probably not the only way, yes, to educate uh, future designers. And here I would like to uh, maybe address this question to uh, Philip, uh, who is uh, involved in uh, educational processes. What should be changed? What should be, uh, you know, done uh, in education uh, to actually make this education relevant to the situation these days? Well, thank you. Uh, do you want me to share my presentation at this point? Yes, please, yeah, I think Let's so. Let's see if I manage this uh, technology then. Uh, I am actually somewhat of a Zoom expert, uh, I, I like to think. Uh, can you see it? It's okay? It's okay, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, so um, uh, as, as Ludmilla said, I'm going to speak a bit about fashion and sustainability in regards to education. 
but a particular kind of education because I'm the head of division at fashion studies at Lund University. And fashion studies is different from, for example, the Beckman School of Design where Jaran teaches because of course, and also uh, in Borås, uh, because in at Beckmans, you train fashion design students. We, we train students in, in different topics and in, in a different approach to fashion because our education is um, solely theoretical and um, that's important to keep in mind. So even though, of course, we, we engage with and we think about uh, the practices of fashion design, we do it from a theoretical viewpoint. And um, the context that we are based in, I would say, is speaking of the Swedish context, is that the Fashion Studies Division at Lund University was established in 2012, following the establishment of Fashion Studies at Stockholm University. And also, I think the third, the third um, uh, center in this, in this field would possibly be the Division of uh, Textile Studies at Uppsala University. So if we look at these three nodes in this network, we have Uppsala, Lund and Stockholm. And um, when fashion studies was established in Stockholm, it was very important for, for them, or for us, I should say, because at that time I was part of, the, of, um, of that uh, division of the Center of, of Fashion Studies as a PhD student and later on as a lecturer. It was really important for us to to define and discuss fashion as a symbolic value and to really um, highlight fashion as a cultural phenomenon, almost a kind of like an abstract value. And that separates fashion studies from textile studies because textile studies, are, they're very focused on materiality, um, uh, textile traditions, uh, the texture, the characteristics of, um, of the materials. And then at Lund University, I think this is also what distinguishes our definition of fashion studies from the practice at Stockholm University. Obviously, we're focused on fashion as a symbolic value, but we also take into consideration the material aspects of, um, of fashion. And this is uh, connected to what you talked about just now, Ludmilla, the lack of textile knowledge, uh, which of course is connected to, I think, a generational issue. It's really something that has that used to be a common knowledge but isn't anymore. So we're living in what I'm hoping is a temporary lack or a temporary void because I'm hoping that this this knowledge will be re-established uh, uh, in, um, in future generations to come. So that's just the, the main background. And also maybe I should just add one more thing because I, I realized, realized something when, when listening to you also Ludmilla when you talked about the timeline of this topic of the fashion and sustainability because I also remember just a few decades back in the 1990s when the subject of sustainability was something that was discussed almost in, in activist settings. It was something that we talked about in in separate groups. I remember when I was when I was young, we would have certain specific groups that worked with the issues uh, connected to the environment and to climate and to, to stop climate change. Well, today I think the topic has become much more mainstream. It's not lo no longer something which takes place on the sidelines, but today we can see it in the in all sectors of the newspapers and we can see it in in mainstream media so there has actually been a significant change in attitudes towards the topic of sustainability not only fashion but i would say generally speaking and that's also something which is hopeful and it's also something that i can see when i meet students but so focusing then specifically on fashion studies at lund university so uh it's a very small division. Uh, we're actually only two or three, <laughs> more or less, uh, people working full time as uh, lecturers um, at Fashion Studies. And as I said, it's been in place since 2012. And when it comes to our educational offer, it only consists of one program, and it's a three year bachelor program. And it's interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary character, so it offers a very wide perspective. We give um, courses on fashion history from the, I would say, late 1200s up until contemporary times. Uh, we focus on contemporary issues in fashion, uh, mainly Western issues, but we try also to include other, 
other aspects and parts of the world, um, not least when speaking of supply chains uh, connected to, in connection to um, matters of sustainability. Also, we include one semester of studies in a different field or department or even university. Many of our, our students choose to go abroad and study in places such as Japan, Italy, Australia, England, and so forth. While, of course, other students uh, prefer to stay in Sweden. Some, only, some just change from our department to another department. Others uh, take courses in Boreos, for example, and so forth. And then we also have an internship period. And this is because we try to balance the program so that there is a framework that we offer that uh, the students, they just have to accept it because it's, it's um, how should I say, it's based in our perception of what, what fashion studies should be. It's based on uh, the research field and how, it's, um, how it has been defined by, by scholars in Sweden and abroad. But then of course, we also want the students to find their own voice and to, to create their own profile. Because some students want to go into maybe PR marketing, others are interested in um, maybe curatorship and uh, future in the, in the museum sector, while others are really interested in matters of sustainability. So we try to balance it so that we offer the framework and then with, within this framework, the students find their own profile. But uh, we all are also planning uh, to develop another program and it will be a master program, um, an international one, and it will hopefully, probably be in place starting the fall of 2023. So we've already been working on this for, for a few years now. And one of the main themes that we are discussing is one on sustainability. And this is in response to not only the way that the research field has developed or the industry has developed, but also, of course, the interests uh, that we see that potential students are expressing. Because when we ask potential future students what, what, what they would like to know more about, uh, this is uh, one of the most common answers. It's really about how to facilitate the, the systemic change that Sandra was talking about how to become one of the stakeholders in this network of, of agents and that work to, to create a new kind of fashion system, a new kind of definition of fashion, uh, also connecting to what Matilda was talking about, uh, how we can engage with fashion as, as a practice, as a kind of verb, as an activity, and uh, how these students then can become part of this new generation. So that's something that we're discussing internally within the uh, division at the moment in order to implement this in the new MA program. And so when the students come to us, uh, we, we want them to, to first learn the basics to, to kind of understand this framework, this, this mapping of fashion studies that we have done as, as the tutors and the lecturers and the scholars of the program. So it's important for us that they learn fashion history, but also that they learn materiality and um, textile knowledge, like basic textile knowledge, how to distinguish different fibers and how to understand the characteristics and to distinguish between uh, uh, synthetic and natural fibers and all of these, these skill sets. And this, what used to be basic knowledge, but is now obviously taught at university level. And this is also, I think, what separates us from the educational offer at Stockholm University, as they are still focused very much on fashion as a symbolic value. But you also mentioned before that uh, uh, production and consumption are two sides of the same coin, so to speak. It's very difficult to talk about um, sustainable fashion and focus solely on changing consumer attitudes and it's very difficult to talk about sustainable fashion and, and not talk about production. So two sides of the same coin but the same way I think we have to talk about two sides of the same coin when it comes to the symbolic value of fashion and, um, and the material qualities of the garments and that's why we introduced already in the first semester the students to um, textile engineers who come to us and have workshops with um, with the textile so that they can feel and touch and uh, experience this, the scent of, uh, of textiles. And then we return to, to courses on textile materiality throughout the program so that we have a kind of a progression 
of, um, of knowledge when it comes to this, the same way we have a progression of knowledge when it comes to, to fashion as a symbolic value. And then also, of course, trying to connect these two sides of learning about fashion as a, as a system that produces the symbolic value interlocked with a system and an international supply chain that, that produces garments. And then also engaging with these questions of, I'm thinking what, about what Matilda talked about, uh, how to care about garments and how to, how to make people take care of, uh, of what we own and to, yeah. It is connected to the, an, an, an emotional, affective dimension of, of owning things. So it's really about unpacking contemporary consumer culture, asking the students or having them engage in dialogue about why, why do we buy the things we buy? Uh, what are the driving forces? And then when we have bought them, how do we treat the things? What kind of um, stories do we tell about the, the, the objects that we buy, the, the garments that we have in our wardrobes? What do we know about the things we have in our wardrobes? What, what kind of methods can we implement to, to, map, uh, to map these uh, geographies that we have in, in our homes when it comes to, to clothes, for example, using uh, uh, wardrobe studies, for example, as a kind of tool to, to see this, this knowledge expressed through uh, through garments, for example. So we're, we're, we're not focusing specifically on the symbolic value, we're not focusing specifically on the materiality, we're not focusing on production or consumption, but again, I'm, I'm hearing myself as an echo of Sandra Rios, but we're trying to, to, to view this in a more holistic way of these agents working together and as a kind of um, collaboration. And by doing that, hopefully in the best of worlds, uh, giving the students tools to, to develop um, new knowledge about how to, when they leave us and go into the industry, because many of our, our students do, uh, then become these agents of, of change within the industry, I would say. So it's, it's funny that I see all of, all of you here on my screen as, as these talking heads, because you're not only heads on, on a screen, but uh, texts by, for example, Sandra Rios and Matilda Tam are used, and also Jan Sundberg, actually, Mjöde Svea is still on the curriculum uh, at Lund University. Um, many of the texts written by, by scholars active in this um, conversation, in this seminar, are also part of, um, of our courses. So it's, um, it's interesting to see that uh, it's, um, that there is this dialogue ongoing, not only here and now, but also, of course, in, in the literature that, that we offer to the students as a way of offering approaches or alternatives, a way of, of viewing, uh, ways of thinking about fashion, approaching fashion, in order to, to do, I think, what, what Sandra was talking about, actually prolonging the, the lifespan of garments. How can we do that? How can we get people to mend uh, something when it's broken? How can we have people care for it? How can we strengthen the bond between uh, wearer and garment? Uh, and uh, we also do that, I think, by including uh, industry voices. Um, and not only industry voices that are actively, how should I say, certified, so to speak, uh, that are, um, you know, uh, the, the correct voices to, to invite. Of course, we have those as well. We have uh, small brands such as the Gothenburg-based Atacac uh, that come to us and we visited their studio and we have other more um, handcraft-based uh, designers who, who come to us, but we also uh, have H&M come to us uh, once a year to talk about their, how they how they buy things, their um, their system of um, of, uh, of buying um, garments, so that the students can can learn about that from the inside. And then we have seminars where we discuss the, the industry lectures uh, to um, to assess and to to have the students um, critically engage with each other based on what the industry what uh, what our industry partners have have told us. And we also go on regular uh, visits 
obviously not now during the pandemic, but otherwise we we go both to Gothenburg and to to Stockholm to visit um, um, uh, design companies to um, to hear how they are working. So just to to summarize, uh, to, to summarize um, or to sum up, I would say that we have decided to engage with this topic of sustainability in two ways, just to simplify it. To really then focus on the character, on the knowledge of the materiality of textiles, of the textures, but also, and of course, supply chain. But then also, of course, to, to engage with fashion as a cultural phenomenon. Why does fashion have this allure? Why, why are people still drawn into to the magic of fashion? When you, Ludmilla, just recently referred to at a court, you, you said that we would mourn the end of fashion. Actually, it could also be a celebration that fashion is ending because what Eliko was talking about is a return to close and to celebrate the value of the garment. So that's also something that we discuss with the students. So just to sum up, a holistic approach to sustainability at the moment uh, on BA level in a few years, also on an MA level. Um, but of course, this is something that I would say is one of the main challenges is that this is something which I'm assuming, I'm hoping, sounds rather thought, well thought out, well planned, but I think something that we struggle with um, as individuals, both as teachers and as students, is to implement this knowledge and to implement these, these topics of conversations into actual practices and to, to bridge the gap between, to, you know, talking the talk and walking the walk, so to speak because this is also something that I talk a lot with the students about, because oftentimes in seminars, we're all agreeing about, you know, how we should uh, buy less and make it last and so forth. But then when I ask them how often they actually go uh, out and buy new things, it's of course on a, on a weekly basis. So this is still, I think, one of our main challenges, how to find ways to actually implement the change we're talking about into an everyday practice. So, thank you. Uh, Philip, thank you so much for this rich presentation. Actually, yes, uh, tackling upon uh, such a variety of uh, questions. And uh, uh, you mentioned the way uh, industries and educational centers uh, these days are trying, yes, to collaborate, collaborate and critical, to become critically engaged with each other. Uh, and uh, well, I know that here in Russia, we do have uh, some design schools, uh, which uh, also collaborate with uh, uh, different uh, companies uh, to actually, uh, you know, to produce, to talk about sustainability, to uh, produce sustainable collections uh, from the leftovers. Uh, and uh, this is something which is done, uh, I guess, uh, globally. Uh, but just uh, talking about this, uh, industries involved. I'd like to address my uh, next uh, question to uh, Joran Sundberg, uh, who is also with us today. And uh, Joran is a senior lecturer at uh, the Beckman's College of Design. As far as I know, uh, designers uh, work very tightly and closely with, uh, this, uh, with the uh, Beckman School. Uh, and uh, Joran, could you just say a few words about the way you at uh, the school are trying, yes, also to tackle upon uh, sustainability issues and yeah, yes. maybe yes. share uh, a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it is a huge problem, obviously, which we, uh, <laughs> I think the discussion so far has um, made very, very clear. Yes, uh, Beckman's um, College of Design uh, has a history of collaborating with the industry. Um, extensively. It started, the school itself was started by two designers in 1939. So uh, it was kind of based on an atelier system from the start. Um, so so as it has been around and, um, and also has come into the education of, of um, yeah, uh, uh, the BA uh, artistic um, education that we give her in three different um, practices, uh, fashion design, product design, and visual communication. Um, so, so obviously also when we think and talk about, yes, there is a, 
a small echo somewhere. Sorry, I try to, to, to disregard of that. Um, when we talk uh, and think and um, an experiment with sustainability and the school, we, we have the, we are very fortunate to be able to do that with, with companies and organizations such as Mistra, which Sandra used to be uh, uh, active in and Matilda also. Um, but also with uh, both small and big companies like H&M and Kapal and um, Lindex and uh, and um, yeah, we, we have quite recent graduates of of, um, of um, Rave Review, two designers who started a, um, a quite successful uh, designer uh, remake business uh, who come to the to the school to lecture and, and do workshop and things like that. Um, so I think it's it's um, it's it's not an extensive. It's not the, the solution for everything, but it is a good strategy to to tackle the issues of sustainability. I think because then you you also come upon the the practical, the real life issues, which I think um, all our students will uh, meet sooner or later. They will meet a boss, or they will meet a system, or they they will meet a producer somewhere in the Far East who, um, who will not be able to collaborate on or, or to, to, change, um, to change production and to change fashion um, in, in, the, in, the, in the quick way we would like to. So, so I think, um, yeah, maybe that could be an answer for that. Uh, thank you, Joran. And uh, um, actually, uh, one more point, which was uh, made uh, by uh, Philip and, and yeah. Matilda, uh, they uh, spoke about uh, care uh, in Matilda's case and uh, materiality and the textiles. This knowledge of material materiality. Mm. And textiles. How important is it for uh, for uh, Beckmans? Uh, to how do you how do you engage uh, your students uh, into this? I mean, do you uh, do do you feel like you have mm -hmm. to? Because uh, uh, Philip spoke about this um, uh, generational gap, mm. things yes. which which people used to know they were n nearly born with this, you know, and something you know, uh, younger people don't don't remember, don't know how to do. So do you do you deal with this uh, problem or not not really? Um, I think I think we do, I th and I think um, so the sustainability issues um, make us uh, that we have to deal with it in different ways. Uh, and I think uh, the way, as as you also pointed out, there are a lot of uh, fashion designers that work with um, dead stock materials and leftovers, and uh, even food waste or, or f waste from other industries a lot these days, even in product design. I think we become more and more aware of the materi materiality and the, the fibers, even the atoms really. I mean, uh, the atoms that come from somewhere, from, from, from plants or from um, oil that we have dug out of the ground. So all of these kind of awarenesses, I think, are, are growing and I hope. Um, and uh, and also the construction and the um, uh, the making of garments is also becoming more important because you look to seams and buttonholes and interlinings and all these kind of things that makes uh, products easy or not easy to to reuse and to make new things from. So that's one thing. Uh, and I also don't think it's only about mending garments. I think it's also about an awareness of of uh, materials and fibers and atoms which are aging and how we relate to that and uh, do we do we only new, need new things uh, do we only need need things from cotton um, those kind of issues and also I think there are a lot of new technologies that are emerging and uh, that I think we need to uh, what's the word to embrace um, I think we will we'll, uh, need to think about, and I think Sandra made a good example of, of fibers which are appearing from, from different plants. Um, and also 3D products and also very much lighter things. I don't think we, um, well, I have a background in tailoring from, cent from decades ago. So sometimes I can kind of lament, lament that a, a jacket today is not made the same way it was in, in maybe the 60s or 70s. 
uh, but it's not, not only a bad thing because uh, it's the same thing with cars and all of the other consumer products that we surround us with. Um, I, I'd like to think that products actually get better and dif different and better. So we have to be vigilant in, 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 uh, in uh, rethinking products and, and garments and also aging and um, yeah, reusing. Thank you, Joran. And uh, the, the thing you s said about, uh, well, textiles and also this attention to the design, how things are, are made. And it leads me to, um, to my uh, next question. And it's actually connected with the, with the text from, uh, from the booklet, from the exhibition, uh, in which they claim that uh, sustainability uh, should be seen as an opportunity rather than a limitation. And uh, it's definitely uh, an opportunity for a designer to uh, actually uh, show your design skills. And I'd like to address my next question to Evalena uh, Jonsson, uh, who is a designer and co-founder of uh, the fashion brand uh, Residus, which uh, means leftovers. Yes, uh, that's right. Do you want me to share my, uh, my yes. slides? Or yes. Is it possible for you to share my slides, Mina? Or uh, uh, no, if you if you can do that, is it fine? Can you do that? Yeah, it's not a problem for me. Uh, but you tell me. Um, I just okay. So I'm gonna share my. Can you see it now? Uh, no, but let me open. Uh, I can uh, I can open uh, the your slides. Just a second. Uh, yeah, we have two of them. Which one uh, goes first? Uh, the one that says two is the second one. <laughs> okay, okay. Then, yes, then, uh, then this one uh, will be our first one. Just a sec. Uh, right. This one, yeah. Can you see it? Uh, yes. It's a bit blurry, but I can see it. <laughs> uh, sorry but, about that. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so this is my, um, well, I'm Evelina and this is my brand. I'm actually an ex-student of both Matilda and Yara. So I graduated from Beckman's in 2012. Um, and this is uh, my brand, Residus, and uh, the woman in the picture here is my beautiful business partner, Elin, who is actually wearing one of our uh, leftover sets in the picture here. And that is uh, where we started out. Uh, we launched our first uh, capsule in 2017. And when we did, the whole capsule was made from uh, leftover fabrics uh, that has come up before here today. Uh, leftover, uh, if, you, if, you work, if you work on the product creation side and in production and with design in the industry, you know that uh, the system is set up in a way where we leave behind find a lot of excess uh, materials because we always start out new season, seasons with wanting to make something new. We want new fabrics, new colors, new prints, new garments, and uh, we also have um, sales collections and we have fashion shows and you make a lot of stuff for these uh, events that never actually turn into real products and it leaves a lot of excess fabric because you can't make 10 meters of a fabric just because you're having a fashion show or because you're doing, you have a sale collection. Um, so we tend to leave a lot of, a lot of stock behind us uh, the way the system is set up right now. And if you've been out in production, you have probably seen hangars full of these old fabrics. I have found amazing fabrics dating all the way back to the 1930s lying around out there. So it really is a treasury. So that's where we started out. We wanted to see, can we try and not make something brand new all the time, but look at what is already lying around out there and what can we make from that? And as you mentioned, that's uh, where the brand name comes from as well. Uh, and if we switch to the next slide. Yeah, just a sec. <laughs> okay, yes. Mm -hmm. So that was the starting point in 2017 when we launched. And then basically we have, of course, built from that and developed a company uh, from sustainable values. That was a really 
important important parts of um, what we wanted to build. So we have uh, the leftover part and I put here leftovers cutting off the 80% tail and I actually, we were actually a part of Mr. Future Fashion and I think that number 80% comes from the Mr. Future Fashion research uh, where 80% of the impact of a finished product comes from the manufacturing of the fabric. So that's why, why we started out in trying to look at what's already out there that's great and beautiful and lying around. So you just turn the design process around a little bit and start from something that's already existing and look at what you can do from that. Um, the latest sort of leftover project that we launched, uh, we launched this fall actually, which is, uh, if you see the knitted sweater here, I am originally from Swedish island Gotland, um, in the, which is in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And we have, uh, some famous sheep uh, that are called the Gotland sheep, and there are lots of them on my home island. And I was there uh, two summers ago and uh, started looking into um, the sheep industry and realizing that uh, because these sheep, they have to be cut all the time, they grow a lot of wool, and, and no one can really take care of this wool. Uh, so. I think on my home island, 70% of that wool is being burned or thrown away every year. And you can actually smell this if you're there um, during the right period of time when the farmers are just burning up all of these amazing wool fibers. And uh, when, if you look at Sweden and the Swedish sheep industry as a whole, the number is even higher. I think it's 80% and a total of uh, almost a thousand or even more than a thousand ton of wool that's being burnt every year from cutting these sheep because we don't take care of it. We don't have systems in place um, taking care of this fiber. So um, this was obviously right up our alley uh, since we're looking at a residue, high fiber quality residue. So um, I started looking at trying to take care of some of this fiber and we launched our first little sort of capsule, uh, capsule trial of Gotland's sheep wool. Uh, garments this fall and it's been really well received uh, it's all the wool comes from Sweden it's spun in Denmark we're knitting in Latvia so we're really close to home with the whole project and uh, customers love it and it's uh, great quality so that's another way of tackling leftovers it doesn't have to be finished materials it can actually be leftover fibers as well and pretty early on uh, uh, in our journey, we also started to look at the conventional sort of system of making things from scratch. Because when you work with leftovers, you always end up with limited edition capsules. Uh, you can never sort of build a basic assortment. You can't do that, uh, which you want to do as a brand. So we started uh, looking also at conventional um, production and making things from scratch. And then you, we had to face that whole 80% tail that we had been able to avoid in our uh, original approach. And as many other companies, of course, you start to look at fibers um, and what I call low impact fibers or lower impact fibers. And uh, um, that I like to look at what it is we're using, the raw material, how that is harvested or grown, who's involved. Where is it being done? Is it certified? And who is, who is doing the process of developing the fiber and what type of energy and water and chemicals are going into that? And it's a really important thing to look at and many companies are doing it, but I'm gonna uh, relate back to Sandra here as well and, and the numbers she brought up from Mr. Future Fashion. The fiber itself is only, I thought it would, was, uh, 20%, I think I saw in her presentation now that it's only 16% of the total impact of the garment. Uh, so it's like great with an, of course you should look at the fiber and uh, try to reduce the impact of the fiber, but it's just a small part of that 80% tail. So that uh, brought me of course uh, into looking at uh, where does the fiber go next? It goes into spinning goes from spinning into knitting or weaving, it goes from knitting, uh, or it goes from a knitted or woven fabric into dyeing, 
and from dying into finishing and all of those processes are actually the biggest strain on on the environment so it got it, it got really important for us to look at that when we were making our own fabrics and looking at knowing who are taking care of these steps how do they work with water consumption how do they work with the people who are involved and close to these chemicals uh, of course uh, labor laws i think is a huge part of sustainability uh, also looking at um, well, all of these, all of these components, really. Uh, so we ended up with all of this information um, where we, and I think, and maybe if you're not on the product creation side, it may come as news to you, but the traditional way of working with fashion as a company, you only know your top layer, which is your CMT manufacturer. That means the people who are actually sewing and putting together your garment. Uh, a lot of the time you have no idea what's going on underneath. Um, so when we had all of, started to have all of this information and making choices um, of what we were creating and what we worked with and who we worked with uh, to reach an, uh, an end product that we felt were in line with our values, we wanted to communicate this toward our consumers as, as well. And uh, this is the picture you can see now with the QR code uh, and the little mobile phone that's uh, reading the QR code. We now have those. We launched this actually um, early 2020. Uh, the platform that shows you. So if you have a garment in front of you, you can read the QR code and the care label and that will throw you into a traceability platform that will show you the whole journey of uh, the garment. So it's really about us opening up our books and showing this is who we work with, this is the fiber we're using, these are the certificates we work with, and this is the journey of the garment that you are looking at buying. Um, so we like to talk about sort of honesty and authenticity uh, in your sustainability work and I think traceability is such an important part of bringing um, bringing the industry forward and it's not only important for the consumers to see what we do and I like to point out that it's nor is it about being perfect uh, or pointing fingers but it's about starting to look at the whole process of what we're creating and what we're doing and who we are affecting but in terms of who and what we're what effects that has and the only way to do that is to actually know the whole supply chain and what you're actually creating at the end as a designer. Does, does that answer the question? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, it just struck me how the actual uh, rhetoric of designers conversation has changed. Mm -hmm. so what I'm, I'm hearing now, yes, uh, is uh, a very, let's say, well-informed, uh, critical, uh, curious uh curious you know uh inquirer into you know into the things uh and uh, this is yeah this is uh i think one of the points uh which we are discussing uh today it's about the the this the systems change it's about the changes on all the layers uh of uh, the whole system yes uh, because yes uh, not only designers users or consumers uh, how things are produced in what conditions uh, materials and knowledge and information as uh, major factors here and I, I'd like to uh, ask um, Mathilda just to uh, probably talk about a little bit about uh, this systems, uh, the, the change of systems. And what also struck me in uh, Evalina's talk is uh, actually this focus uh, on care again. I have heard uh, the very word care so many times. And uh, yes, it, it seems like yeah, this is also something we should probably look into. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Um, so exciting to hear from all of you. It's, it's so brilliant to be part of this. Thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, so I work at the Linnaeus University in the south of Sweden and also at uh, Goldsmiths, which is part of the University of London. And uh, I, I hope to sort of say something about 
why we need systems change and what it can mean in, in different ways, I think. I hope that's okay. So where, where I work now, we, we take this uh, touching the ground and touching uh, materials and caring very seriously. So we work with different animals, we work with performance, we work with farming. So we try to thread threads through our systems in very different ways and also through, through our research, our collaborations and our educations. And I've been banging on about systems change for quite a while, I realized since my time at, as a student at Beckman School of Design through my <laughs> PhD and also experiencing calling up the big companies saying, have you heard about the volumes? It's dangerous. And they put the phone down on me and now, now it's possible to, to have very different conversations and, and that's really so exciting I have to say and I think one of the things that I'm really passionate about is that we have this space to dream. Uh, we can dream fashion, we can dream design in entirely different new ways or in old new ways as well and that is a license we have and let's, let's kind of engage with that because it's beautiful. And the, the work we try to do uh, in my different collaborations is this is uncompromisingly systemic approaches to futures making. And what we mean by that is that we, we have to put apples and mobile phones and soil and people together. We can't separate environmental, social, cultural and economic issues. We have to hack the complexity, so to speak, and stay with the trouble, as um, Donna Haraway would say. And the reason we have to do that is quite clear. So if you look at the people behind, uh, say, planetary boundary support and, and be behind um, uh, also uh, the, the climate um, international panel of climate change, we can't sort of do moderate fixes anymore. We have to look at system change and, and do a great transition. And when we translate this to the fashion, fashion system, I think it's important to understand that uh, it's great to do stuff at the level of the product. So replacing uh, conventionally farmed cotton with organic cotton. But so long as the sector keeps expanding, uh, we're just making things uh, worse a little bit slow more slowly so to speak and the same with business models great with new business models infrastructures but still if the sector keeps expanding we're not going to have a net reduction so we need to think at the level of of mindsets culture and, and paradigms and this is a little bit like you know the toy the kaleidoscope when when you start thinking there and thinking what if we actually challenge the growth logic that's driving society? Very different patterns can flow. It's not easy, it hurts like hell, but there are different ways and that's also where our freedom is. And so this is what uh, I'm working in in a few different fashion contexts and one of this is uh, Earth Logic, which is um, a publication and it's a plan for research. It's a campaign um, and I think it's starting to become a kind of a movement as well. It's, uh, it's something I've uh, worked with together with uh, Professor Kate Fletcher in the UK. We have a very long collaboration <laughs> behind us as well. We've been banging on many doors. And this is a radical invitation to, to business, governance, media, research, education, citizens to put Earth first. So put the health of Earth, all the species, all the people before anything else. And this uh, plan is a values explicit context, like care. And it's uh, also thinking about what we need to leave behind or let go of. Uh, the first principle there is that it's someone else's responsibility. It isn't, it's my responsibility. It's our responsibility. Uh, but there are also really beautiful things that we can take with us. So community, which I see building up here in our conversations, uh, resilience and courage. And then there are uh, six uh, holistic landscapes to work with. And we've been, we launched this plan at London Fashion Week in February this year. And uh, we were preparing this grand tour, which obviously didn't happen live because of COVID, but instead we went on a Zoom tour. And through that we met, we've, um, and lots of different media contacts, we reached around a million people. And we also met a lot of people and had 
exciting conversations with uh, you know people in New Zealand, in, in Africa, in different places. And one thing that I really feel is that there is such an appetite and courage for systems change now. So it's a very different landscape and, and obviously COVID has also helped us see what really matters and also the vulnerability of communities and of the fashion sector. And we can think about that a little bit like a dress rehearsal because uh, it's going to get a lot worse with the <laughs> climate disaster. We know that. We may not feel that, but we know that somewhere. So we can see this as a, as a dress rehearsal. Um, and Another thing that we have really sensed in this and in the work before is this notion of collaboration and what it means to really turn yourself to collaboration, which I think is when you really do that, you also lose some of your own footing because you have to say, I don't know anything about that. Uh, I'm not sure. It makes me feel uncomfortable. But also in these collaborations, we can gain a lot of strength. So a few years ago, uh, two years ago, something like that, we, um, Linda Grouse, Timo Rissonen, Kate Fletcher and I launched a union of concerned researchers in fashion, which now has, it's a global network of, of researchers and, and people in industry and stuff. And what we realized that is that we really need to have an activist knowledge ecology where we can share things in a really uh, uh, simple and easy way. And, um, this has been a, a fantastic journey where we've learned a lot because in, in the different working groups we are, we realize we know so little of so much of the world. So now we've launched a campaign to make the board more plural, got lots of applications. We've changed the constitution of the board to make this happen. So you can, we can set up new processes, new ways to govern stuff, to make new actions possible. And I, I think there is, uh, so much hope in that. Um, a hope that we can rethink systems. Uh, so um, at the moment we are engaging in lots of different reports but one thing I want to really say when it comes to systems change as a final thing is that it's really uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, and I think one of the coming back to fashion education and fashion practice is that one of the things we really need to uh, take with us in change agency is the friction uh, at, and that we have to prepare to really create some bad um, atmosphere <laughs> to say things that people find uh, challenging, itchy, make them angry, it's okay and again because uh, environmental disaster is going to be a lot worse. So let's, let's go for some system change and I hope, really hope this says thank you very much in Russian uh, if it doesn't, I, I blame Google Translation. Thank you. I feel that it absolutely does. Uh, Great. It, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Risky, thank risky you. business, Google Translation. <laughs> thank you so much for the for the presentation. And so, yeah, for the actually very enthusiastic and hopeful and very positive uh, view on the process. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, we have spoken so much about the textiles, yes, and the materiality, and uh, I'd like to uh, also invite uh, uh, Jonas Larsson to, to join our conversation, uh, who um, is from uh, Swedish School of Textiles at the University of Gross. And uh, Jonas, uh, as, as far as I know, uh, well, when it comes to, to talk about, you know, new textiles and some experimental spirit uh, in this field. It's uh, the first school which is mentioned uh, in, in Sweden at least. So uh, is, it, is it also one of the take uh, of the school on sustainability through the textiles, through the experiments? Uh, yes, um, I would say it is. It is, um, um, I have my presentation here and I will share a little bit how we think. I mean, and you have to uh, consider that this, um, these are projects that I have been involved in uh, and many of these projects, they come from technologies that has been developed at the Swedish School of Textiles. Uh, and uh, so all my colleagues here at the Swedish School of Textiles are uh, sort of behind this projects in, in one way or another um, and um, um, but I can just mention a few things about the Swedish School of Textile and it is it, it's an interdisciplinary 
uh, university uh, or uh, yeah uh, where we have uh, fashion and textile design uh, textile technology and uh, textile management uh, and we try to work uh, between these three disciplines as much as possible although it's it's uh, at some times difficult um, uh, hopefully I'll show you how we have succeeded a little bit with this presentation and uh, uh, let's see here okay so yeah um, as we said Jonas Larsson is my name and this uh, and this uh, presentation will sort of end up at the uh, the idea of uh, regenerative microsystems, uh, one uh, which could be one way of moving towards a more sustainable uh, textile and fashion industry. Uh, yeah, so, but why do we do this? Uh, well, if we look at the fashion system in general, uh, I, a good friend of mine, he, he once said that if you look objectively at the apparel system, you would think that the people who built it are stupid. and uh, if we look at the data, it's uh, it's very close to the truth, because uh, we have two thirds of what is manufactured is sold at full price. Uh, we haven't confirmed this, but um, indicators show that it might be only 50%. Uh, so we have a tremendous overproduction uh, in the apparel system. 60% uh, of jeans customers have a hard time uh, finding their size. So if you have, if you cannot find genes that fit you, uh, you're normal. Uh, 21% average return rate in Sweden, 35% for fast fashion, up to 70%. 60% uh, of returns uh, due to not meeting customers' fitting preferences. Uh, we consume a lot of uh, textile fabrics in Sweden, uh, 14 kilos, uh, 17 kilos disappear uh, uh, in, the, um, in the waste bin or somewhere else. Um, I think we only have 1% meaningful recycling of textiles uh, globally. So there's a lot of waste in our fashion system. And a lot of the activities we engage in, uh, they are aiming at reducing this waste in, in one way or another. Uh, uh, so how do we approach it? And if we look at sustainability data in, in, in general, uh, and we look at this graph, um, where we have uh, zero uh, on the vertical axis here indicates um, a sustainable system and minus 100 uh, indicates that we don't know where to start uh, or we don't have uh, any processes in place to be sustainable. Then the industry in general in 2020 uh, now performs at minus 58. So we have a long way to go before we can call ourselves uh, sustainable. And this data here comes from um, comes from the HIG index, um, which is uh, a global um, assessment tool uh, for the industry. Um, well, I have indicated here also that there's a leap here, and there's an arrow, fatter arrow here, and then there's this little leap. And this fat arrow, arrow indicates, and this leap here indicates how we've set the targets for the industry. You read uh, a lot that yeah, we we uh, want to make sure that we don't have any unnecessary environmental impact. But in the word an unnecessary, that opens up for a lot of interpretation. And you can say, yeah, but I had to pollute this river to make money. It was necessary for me. Uh, so many of the goals that the industry has set for itself, it's not, it will not reach a sustainable state. Um, so we have to take a leap. and. Much of the many of the projects that we are engaged in, um, uh, hopefully, will help uh, the industry to take this leap to become sustainable. Uh, perhaps not fully sustainable at the year 2030, uh, but uh, on the way, good way of getting there. And uh, one uh, tool that we're using to to uh, reach uh, uh, that goal uh, is the Sustainable Development Goals by the uh, United Nations. Uh, and we, of course, also look a lot of, at other sources. Uh, for example, I, I find uh, the work that's done within Mr. Future Fashion uh, um, uh, very useful to, to design projects that help the industry uh, to reduce environmental impact and, uh, and also have a, a better social impact. Um, 
one um, when we look at about look at uh, the development of the industry um, and particularly in the development towards more sustainable and circular business models uh, we sometimes make this separation we look at design we look at the business models and we look at material and what a mistake that is often done is that we see these as different entities uh, and that we can make trade-offs between them so if we have a very circular material uh, then we think oh well that is great then i don't have to think about my design uh, i don't have a, have to have a such sustainable design or such circular design because my materials are so great uh, same with the business model but uh, we don't have to have such a good business model because our design is so sustainable but uh, I, I don't think this is correct. I think these three has to, seen, to, has to be seen together as one. Uh, that the design, the material, and the business model, they move together uh, upwards. Um, yeah. So how do, we, how do we do this? What, what type of examples do we have? Well, we have uh, in, our, in our research uh, focused a lot of minimizing overproduction uh, and waste. Uh, and one approach to that uh, we have done together with, uh, with Houdini Sportswear, uh, a Swedish uh, sportswear brand or outdoor brand, uh, which have, they, they have a high sustainability profile and they have done many great things uh, towards circularity uh, in recent years. Uh, so what we did was uh, we uh, created a, a system uh, that, uh, 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 on-demand system uh, that uh, lets people um, uh, create their own avatar in this uh, virtual uh, fitting room um, with their um, measurements. And then we put a, a power hoodie and the power hoodie is their iconic product. Uh, and the, the consumers could have that made to measure. So you see that here, they, the, cons the customer can sort of pull the sleeves and make the uh, sleeves longer, uh, fit them better to the arm and also over the over the, uh, but to have a little bit uh, warmer uh, there. And then uh, purchase, and then the system that we had built around this, uh, if it was waiting, uh, it could manufacture this garment and have it delivered within something like three hours. Um, so which has the potential to significantly reduce lead times. Um, and uh, with that uh, uh, um, risk, uh, inventory risk uh, and also uh, respond to um, consumers wishes in a better way. Um, we have um, taken also this this is actually uh, Sandra Rose's fault uh, this Hugo car. Uh, we uh, what we did was that we looked at the data from Mr. Future Fashion and we saw that uh, the impact from customer transportation um, it's very high. Uh, in the in the diagram, uh, Sandra showed it's a, 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 I think 11% of impact. Um, but if uh, that is a mix between bus and bus and uh, car transportation to the pickup point, but if people only drive their cars, I think uh, seven kilometers or so to the pickup point, it can be much higher. I think perhaps uh, as much as 25% in in some bad cases. So what we did, we looked at this data. Uh, and we also uh, in uh, and we said, but this is what, what opportunities do we have here uh, to uh, to improve the system? Uh, and then uh, my my friend who who has uh, who owns this company that builds this uh, autonomous delivery vehicle, Hugo, he said, but well, then we let's build um, let's build a, a, a autonomous delivery vehicle that takes care of that. Uh, that uh, instead of people are driving around in two tons of steel. Uh, with uh, fueled with uh, fossil fuels, uh, we use uh, nine kilos of uh, um, plastic and electricity instead to do the same transportation job. Uh, the other insight uh, why we did this uh, was that um, we uh, we asked ourselves what's the problem with the sharing economy? It, because if we think about the sharing economy, it make, makes perfect sense. Uh, we share uh, clothes uh, that we don't use often, we share tools that we don't use often, kitchen appliances, whatever it might be. But, but, and then, but we don't do that, and what's the problem? Uh, and then we thought, well, maybe the, tran 
the actual sharing in the sharing economy uh, is the problem. So then we thought, but maybe Hugo can do that sharing. So take care of the, all the logistics uh, in the sharing economy, getting the things back and forth between the different households and people in this sharing economy. Uh, that led us uh, also to um, to use uh, to further explore the use of technology to create circular economies and uh, sustainable systems. And um, this is a very fascinating uh, tool uh, or or uh, technology, the the Williot, which is a blue battery-less uh, Bluetooth technology. It doesn't require any battery. Um, so what you uh, uh, it works a little bit like RFID or NFC uh, in the way that it can communicate with your cell phone. Um, and um, uh, so what we see ahead of us is that we can build a system that lets the garment speak to the, to the user. So for example, like this, hey, I've been sitting in your wardrobe for the last six months. Uh, don't you love me anymore? Well, it's not, it's not you, it's me. I've changed and we are not the match anymore. Uh, okay, uh, do you want to sell me? Uh, yes, I think you'd be better off with somebody else. Okay, there's actually someone who's willing to pay 40 euros for me at eBay. Should I sell myself? Uh, yes, please do that. Okay, uh, can Hugo pick me up tonight? Uh, yes, at eight o'clock. Okay, great, pick up at 8 a.m. And then everybody's happy. So using this type of... Um, we have many more approaches uh, to circular economies than this. Uh, remake is one of them with the retextile project. Um, but uh, this type of um, projects uh, and the sustainable development goals as a foundation, we can um, um, uh, help uh, uh, companies to create this type of sustainable systems. But I don't think that this is enough. Uh, we have to, we have to really get into the positive realm here. And Matilda, you spoke a little bit about this uh, uh, earlier too. And uh, I'm also gonna uh, come into what Eva Lena uh, talked about uh, the wool. Uh, so there is this, there is actually the Swedish wool initiative, which perhaps could be relevant, that aims to take care of uh, this uh, wool that is uh, now burnt. But anyway. Uh, uh, our approach to sort of getting into the positive realm uh, uh, of the sustain uh, or positive part of the sustainability realm, uh, uh, it's it's this uh, uh, to create the regenerative microsystems. Uh, they essentially uh, consist of three parts: um, fibers from uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, and regenerative uh, means. Uh, to improve a place or system so that it is active or producing good results again. Or, or it can mean to grow again or to make something grow again, for example, a new tissues or a part and so on. Uh, so that is the one part. The other part is uh, this type of uh, ideal uh, factories that only manufactures what the uh, customer wants and can take care of um, garments that come back from the user uh, and update them or refresh them or uh, redesign them or remake them or uh, whatever you want to do. And the third part is the transformative community that we need to, we need to change uh, how people are behaving around uh, fashion and garments. And uh, we have a project called Fact Movement uh, that tries to teach um, uh, uh, consumers this. Uh, then we add, of course, this design perspective to this. And not only because designers are the ones who can make this uh, beautiful, uh, but only because there is a the design process, the way that a designer's thinking um, is very, very helpful uh, uh, in how we can approach these problems. Um, for example, the, the designer is sort of the only one who can uh, sort of draw the image uh, of how the, the future should look like, or they're the ones that should do that anyway. Uh, we also have the systems perspective here where we can use the sustainable development goals, for example, uh, as indicators for how, how we're moving forward. Uh, one, one of the approaches here I think very interesting is from a um, um, uh, uh, design studio in Stockholm called Gringo Design Studios that we have been working with for many years. Um, 
the approach comes from the idea, the Japanese uh, idea world around the cherry blossom. And the idea, the, the world is, it's called mono no aware. It means to appreciate the transience of things. Uh, and here, the cherry blossom, it lives for a very short while uh, uh, and it's very beautiful. When it falls to the ground, it becomes nutrition again for the tree to grow new cherry blossoms. And what is very central here is that in this system, no waste exists. In a natural system, we don't have any waste. Everything is consumed uh, and produced uh, in, in, in sort of, in not, not infinite loop, but very long loops. And uh, same idea we have applied uh, on making um, uh, garments. So we have, uh, our, uh, the idea is that it's designed to dye. And these garments, we've used uh, 3D printing technology uh, of bioplastics and uh, cellulose material. Uh, and these garments are uh, right now fully recyclable uh, in uh, biogas uh, uh, plants. Uh, the, the plan is to make this fully circular in, in any um, biological process. Uh, but we have done it like this, that you see the sort of the, the red, the, um, the, the black lines here, they are the veins of the leaf and the white um, surface, that's the sort of the green stuff of the leaf. Um, sorry, I don't know exact, the exact words. Uh, and uh, so this was a fascinating project and you also see the little Puma uh, logo there. So this project was picked up by Puma um, as, a, as an inspirational project for the people who work at Puma. Um, so we did some work for them. Uh, but uh, the ch sheep, sheep uh, also very interesting in this context. Uh, there are ways of uh, making uh, sheep or ways of letting sheep graze um, in an, an, it's called holistic racing, uh, a way of capturing uh, carbon uh, with the help of the photosynthesis and with the help of, help of sheep and actually, yeah, getting carbon uh, down from the atmosphere again uh, and putting it into the ground uh, at the same time, restoring biodiversity, uh, restoring waterways could even help to draw out chemicals uh, from the ground or capture chemicals uh, so we don't get them into our uh, bloodstreams, et cetera. Uh, and this is a very interesting way forward. Um, and uh, one of the tracks that, uh, um, that um, the wool, uh, Swedish Wool Initiative, uh, uh, that is uh, partly run from uh, the science park here, uh, is looking at. And um, yeah, so this is uh, a few of the takes uh, on how we think that uh, and we can create uh, regenerative microsystems. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you uh, for that. Hope uh, you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jonas, for the, for the fantastic presentation and the projects uh, you spoke about. And uh, I absolutely love that chat, you know, between the garment and the, the, the user. Uh, you just, uh, I felt like uh, I traveled to the future. So what is uh, interesting about this, uh, you know, imagining the future of uh, fashion or slash clothing, because it seems like, yes, we are talking about the changing systems, the changing vocabularies of uh, fashion. And uh, it's um, a combination of uh, very advanced technologies on the one hand, but at the same time, the very, let's say, uh, down to earth, uh, very material, very uh, human, the touch and the feel uh, things. Uh, so uh, if we talk about future of fashion or clothing industry uh, in general, I understand that it's like, you know, too big a talk to start it when we have only half an hour left. Uh, but, but still, uh, how, how, do you, how do you envision it? So because, you know, uh, when we talk to designers uh, these days, I mean, uh, students at design schools, this year is very specific, I must say. We can see how the tone of the collections changed, how the students started to look back rather than look forward. Uh, so we can see the escapism of uh, most of the project they are involved. And it's, of course, the moment we live in. Uh, but the future is there. And uh, Mathilde said, you know, there was a point when we just, uh, you know, mostly uh, 
met with uh, doors banged on us. But these days, uh, the, 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 the conversation about sustainability uh, abs has absolutely changed. Yes, we, we, are, we seem like to be talking uh, about the same things and sharing quite a lot. So uh, how do you envision the actual development of uh, the industry, which um, has been demonized so much? Yes, they say that, uh, well, and of course, there is a huge impact. We, we do know that. Uh, but as you said, uh, if we yeah, try to change the systems, which we are trying to do, um, how, do we, how do we see a fashion uh, system uh, in the future? Uh, Mathilda, uh, could you probably say a few words about, you know, that, so just give, uh, share your futuristic ideas. I think in the future, and I hope it's soon, industry will have a much smaller role in the fashion uh, system and fashion will be decentralized to uh, citizens, uh, different forms of governance, uh, media, uh, universities, schools, learning, and be many more hubs. Today, industry dominates the, the fashion discussion and what needs to be done and what's, what's not done. And because the uh, material through, throughput and, and resource use needs to shrink uh, by necessity, uh, we, we need to have other type of, of fashion, fashion activity. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why, and I think that, I mean, yes, I, 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 I see things um, uh, positively, but I think there are also some very important trade-offs to address. And one of the uh, frequent um, whataboutisms today is that, no, we can't shrink the industry because what about the workers who are dependent on employment in different parts of the world? No, that's the wrong kind of trade-off because people in different parts of the world will not have employment if there is not a planet. And people in, in parts of the world that are most vulnerable to unemployment are also most vulnerable to climate change. So we, we need to really take on board those very tough things and the fashion sector needs to shrink. We can't use this much water, we can't use this much resources, we can't abuse people in this way. So that's, uh, but fashion can grow and we can also grow our inner planets. I mean, we can, we can grow ourselves, we can, we can develop, we can learn, we can care. We do lots of things, but we, we must shrink the, the fashion sector in the material sense and in, in, in how it abuses people as well. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, just would like to add to that. Could, because um, the way I think about it, Matilda, I see it as, yes, we have to shrink consumption. That's what you're referring to, or the material use. And, um, but isn't it, isn't it also about um, t sort of taking a step back towards a world where fashion is a luxury? And that you, um, I mean, the buy less, pay more kind of. So you're also, so you can also perhaps keep a lot of the workers, but but pay them properly. And uh, I mean, that type of, we're, we are going to consume, but I think the issue or like the heritage that we're dealing with today is, is uh, what, what has been the big movement of the last century, which was, uh, democrat, uh, democratizing in of of fashion and consumption that has sort of um, gone a bit high, and that we need to sort of step back and realize that yes, uh, we we can still consume and we can still buy, but it just has to be less, and we have to pay more. That's very short. I think what we can consume is, is kind of toilet paper and some food. I think that's the end of it. I think the rest is, is use, care, nurture, steward, you know, garden, do lots of other things. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yes, we can pay people more. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think it's really important to recognize that on a planetary scale, the human household has to shrink. For lots of people, the household still has to grow. So there are still people who have not access to the clothing they need, who are desperate to use 
uh, Black Friday to be able to have the bare essentials. So for, for some people, it's not about transitioning to luxury, but covering the basis. And that's where we also need to really collaborate with, with governance so mm -hmm. that people have access to basic needs and also to means of expression and participation in different ways. So that the collaborations there, I think, are super important, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it just, uh, is anyone else would like to, yes, to somehow try to fantasize about the future or we can move on to other questions? And uh, yes, those who are watching us on YouTube, uh, remember that we, yes, we have uh, access to your questions and comments and you are more than welcome to ask your questions. Uh, I'd yes. like to fantasize a bit <laughs> about the future. Uh, I hope we will be fact-driven in the future. I hope that uh, that when we uh, produce garments, uh, either if we do it uh, new in the way we do today, or if we remake or reuse, that uh, a lot of more information will follow. And uh, in this way, I think consumers will see all the steps that Eva Lena talked about. I mean, people sort of think that garment just there's cotton fibers and then a garment just appears uh, and they don't see all the work and all the many peoples in the chain that have put in a lot of effort so i think with more fact i think the value of garment will increase which means also the second hand value and the third hand value will increase uh, and we will also see the difference because um, there are garments with a high footprint and garments with a low footprint. And some garments we could consume more of, while others we should definitely consume less of. But today we don't really see the difference because it's hidden in all these long supply chains. So with uh, like HIG index that Jonas spoke about, to have a uh, fact, uh, both socially and environmentally on each product that I think is the future so that the consumer can actually make uh, informed or sorry, the users can make informed choices. And the designers. Sorry, what did you say? And the designers. And the designers, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yes, informed choices. Uh, so information is, of course, important. And you know what uh, I noticed? Maybe uh, it's a kind of influence of uh, lockdown and uh, quarantine uh, on myself as a user. I'm not saying consumer. Uh, so uh, I just uh, realized that I really want to know more about uh, clothes. I really want different kind of stories because we know that, yes, fashion has been always about storytelling. But it seems like these days, yes, we want to know uh, about what your garment is made from, how it uh, was made, where it was made. So we uh, seem to be starting asking, uh, you know, different questions. And, uh, you know, when I, when I fantasize about the future, I always like, yeah, of course, imagine that we come to, to the shop or do online shopping and we look at the tag and actually that tag tells us the whole story and uh, this is what we are lacking these days and uh, recently i think i i, I found uh, yes i'm well i'm not saying the name of the brand just uh, there was this garment and instead of just you know saying the standard things it actually spoke uh, you know in a different language to me and uh, i felt that yes i really needed that garment because it felt like it was more like my friend rather than just, you know, an, a thing which I put on and then forget about. So we are also talking about, yes, different conversation, different communication, uh, do we? Uh, and uh, I, I know that uh, Joran actually uh, decided not to share his presentation, uh, but yes, in his presentation, he looks at some of the, some of the projects and, uh, yeah, I just uh, think it's unfair to, uh, you know, to just leave that uh, presentation outside the conversation. Oh, oh don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> after, after one and a half hour, it would feel a little bit like going back. It was a presentation of my design practice and uh, a little bit about the projects in the school. Um, 
But yes, I, I think what you are expressing uh, is part of the design um, curriculum. I think, I think things like information about uh, the origin and the material and the maker and all of that um, is very important in a, in a contemporary fashion product. And, and, and I, I believe that, that information will be a big part of it in like blockchain systems and things like that. But, but I also think those things uh, with a very good designer like Eva Lena, <laughs> those things become apparent. I mean, the, the, to return to the word care, I think care of, of, of who you work with uh, as a producer, it, it shows uh, subtly or, or very overtly in the product as well. And I think hopefully, and I think probably um, users will be much more sensitive to that. Um, and uh, maybe I, I would like to return to Matilda's point as well, that um, I think consumption and the reason for consumption will be, or using, <laughs> sorry, a new vocabulary, uh, will be very different very soon. And I think, um, I think designers will, there, there's, a, as a, there's a very big and very important nut to kind of solve there. How, how do we, because I think all of us who, are, who join this discussion, we like fashion, we like the, the function of fashion, the magic and the joy and the um, fantasy that it can produce. Uh, but how can you, how can you um, kind of channel that into something which doesn't put more um, atoms into the at at atmosphere and to landfills and to um, clothing bonfires and all of that. How do we solve that problem? And I think, um, I think that's, that, was, that is one of the important questions that we have to um, focus on. Um, and I think, I don't think designers can, can solve that by themselves. Um, I think so designers maybe can make proposals. We can make uh, suggestions. We can, we can show ideas or, or um, um, like small, small things that can, that can be um, maybe hopefully show us the way forward. Uh, thank you, Joran. And uh, what you said about the function of fashion, the mm. fun part of it, the fantasy, yeah. uh, it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, to, to go away. It's probably the changed kind of fun, you know, mm. uh, which we are talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, what I noticed recently from, uh, again, you know, I'm very much talking today from my own experience as a user, uh, that uh, I started to feel, you know, uh, let's say, um, a bit ashamed to, you know, to buy uh, newer things and started to experience uh, a very, you know, unusual and unexpected emotions when it comes to uh, going to the shops, when it comes to dealing with uh, clothes. So it seems like it's the sign of, of, uh, of uh, the, the days uh, and uh, probably, yes, as we, uh, as I already said, it's a different kind of enjoyment uh, and uh, different kind of relationships uh, between us as users or as producers, uh, designers and, uh, and clothing. Uh, and uh, my, my final question, I'm afraid, uh, is again, a general one, because I know that today uh, a lot of young designers are watching this uh, conversation and following this panel. And uh, when, of course, when we talk about the future of fashion, we should remember about, you know, the, the, the actual uh, present of uh, design education, because this is, uh, this is the way we design the future of uh, fashion. And uh, could you just share uh, maybe your advice with uh, young designers who are studying fashion design uh, these days? Uh, so what, what, would you, what would you say to them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very difficult. I, I don't think I am the, the, um, in the position to advise really. Um, I think maybe, maybe the, other, the other participants here can, can fill in and give other uh, intelligent uh, answers to that question. I think uh, what I hope to give students is the tools, artistic tools, 
to do whatever they choose uh, within the within the um, how do you say framework that that we teach here within fashion and clothing and um, image making uh, and also a critical mind to kind of uh, to question and reflect on what they're doing and what they see themselves and I think these days because uh, what I I take a lot from this conversation and I think a lot of it is the importance of systems thinking. Um, so, and I think that will be very, very important for the future that the designer, as well as everyone else who's uh, participating in the fashion system, will have to think about the system a lot. So I think those three things are, are what I hope to give the designers and I would, that I would suggest that they um, focus on themselves. So the artistic tools, um, uh, and the knowledge of the system and the critical thinking. I think those are the things. Because, because I mean, I think it's a cliche. We, we, we will not know what will happen in the fashion system in five years. It's impossible for, for me to know, I think. So, um, so uh, the ability to change and to critically reflect, I think, is the most important things. Yeah, thank you. And uh, well, I just uh, uh, today uh, we we spoke about yes this criti critical critical attitude, uh, but also about the importance of research, and uh, uh, we we should look at uh, fashion design practice not as just you know just creating you know dreams uh, 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 from nowhere uh, with uh, you know some fantastic tools, but actually as a research process because research is essential when it comes to fashion design. And what Evelina actually shared with us today was like, you know, this uh, very essence of uh, fashion design. So, uh, well, again, I have still that, uh, you know, kind of addressing uh, our maybe design students who, who are watching uh, in us in Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and elsewhere. Any, any? I, I have a. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm in. Uh, I, I, I uh, am in the process of uh, trying to understand uh, the design perspective because I, I showed you there we have the, the systems perspective, of, uh, but then also the design perspective. And I'm, I'm trying to sort of understand the different components of, of that perspective. Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, sometimes very difficult, but but I think that uh, designers what designers are very good at they're very good at imagining what's going to happen and imagining the future. And uh, what I uh, sometimes um, uh, miss a little bit, but this is because also because designers they end up in the system as everybody else and are taught this ways of this bad system. But um, what, I what I would like a little bit more from uh, designers is to perhaps be better at uh, using uh, their design as vehicles to take us into this bright future. Um, that would be, uh, I think, very good to use their design to explain what will the bright future look like. Uh, that I think it would be great um, to see more of that. Thank you. Uh, again, yes, again, we, we, we uh, mean, I, I suppose, uh, the research uh, component uh, of, of the design. And actually, yes, uh, to make uh, very complex ideas, uh, very, uh, I'm not saying simple, but... Yeah, but yes, tangible, simple, yes, perhaps. Tangible. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, if anyone, I, I just, yeah, just uh, trying to see if, yeah, Matilda, please. I think what I'd like to um, invite fashion students to do is to make their own fashion space, like Eva Lena has done, for example. And th there are so many different fashion spaces, and, and there is a lot of freedom there. And uh, the other thing is really to uh, not be scared of making a fuss, as in say, no, stop, I don't like this. Yes, I do like this. And it is not easy and it can be very uncomfortable, but it's worth it because it's also about building a sustainable practice where you can live with yourself, hopefully for many years. And then you need to make a fuss sometimes. And the third one is to look after yourself because change making is hard and you do that 
by uh, probably doing some yoga and other things, but mainly by being part of a community. I think it's really important that students find their bodies and that's so much easier today with, with uh, social media and, and forums like this, but it's great when we find the people we want to work with because then we can have a lot of support and also say when we're scared and when things go well, brag together is good as well. So I, I think you should really do that. Um, Sildas, thank you so much actually for raising all those issues. Uh, of course, uh, these days we, we can't get together that often, you know, uh, and, uh, but we do know that creative people actually need this uh, co-creative uh, space to, uh, to make fuss, to, yes, to, to try to, you know, uh, create new fashion spaces. Hopefully, yes, it, uh, there is some light in, at the end of the tunnel and the pandemic will be over uh, when we can, you know, get together again. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, I really like to uh, thank everyone uh, for this uh, fantastic panel uh, and uh, this conversation which uh, we uh, have uh, actually uh, gone through together and it seems like two hours isn't enough. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I, 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 can, I can see it only as a beginning and uh, there were so many points today which I found uh, absolutely fascinating and thought provoking. And uh, thank you so much uh, to all our participants uh, and uh, thank you so much for, uh, yes, uh, for this opportunity to uh, put together this fantastic panel to uh, the Embassy of Sweden in Moscow, to Swedish Institute and to the Arts and Design School, Higher School of Economics, Moscow. So, uh, friends, colleagues, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you in the nearest future via Zoom for sure and maybe, yes, maybe uh, offline as well. Uh, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you.